Hello, time to return to a fun project at OpenHD. I get still quite a lot of comments and questions about it, and it's one of the things I kept meaning to get back to, but sort of locked down, kept putting it to the back of the pile, and then other things were happening. But finally, I've decided to spend some proper time on it, find out what's happening. If you can recall, from last time I made a three part video, one was introduction, two was how to connect things on the bench, three was testing it out on a sort of iNav rover idea. Which is this guy here, um, and just to explain this is an old Tamiya model, uh, just modified to add things like this servo to do a pan tilt, this is a Pi Zero in there, it's got its um, Wi-Fi module here, a bit wobbly, uh, we've got a flight controller here running iNav and there's a GPS and compass. Now that worked fine but there were a few problems. One of which uh, were a couple of like software problems with iNav or iNav and its Mavlink protocol and OpenHD being able to read it which was all wrong. So everything always pointed north so I don't think Return to Home would have ever worked. Not that I got to try it at the time. The other thing I had a problem with is I was using this. This is a quite nice little system. This is a seven inch touchscreen for a Pi. Uh, I've got a Pi 4 on the back there. It's got all the connectors and stuff. Really nice if it's sat here in front of you and you can see it. Outside, this may as well be a mirror in terms of being able to look and see what you're doing. And the camera I was using, which is uh, the sort of camera for the Pi Zero with a little adapter board, isn't the best. It, it feels like FPV camera from five years ago where the, the the wide dynamic range, well there isn't any, it's it's quite poor. So if you haven't got a good picture and you're looking at a very reflective screen, it's very difficult to uh, look at. So I figured that before I went on and did the next stage of OpenHD, I should go back and fix all the problems I had and get it as good as I can. The other thing I wanted to do is because I was dealing there with, I was dealing with OpenHD version 2 release candidate 17 and iNav 252. Both of those things have moved on, especially iNav. iNav's just gone to version 3 and 3.0.1 is the latest at the time I'm recording this. OpenHD is on 208. So I thought the first thing I would do is update both of those and pretend I'm doing a new install again. And the reason I wanted to do it from scratch is not to show you here on the video, is so I could write a proper blog post doing a bit of a more of a step-by-step -step. because although I showed myself like typing lots of Linux commands on the screen and, and saying what files I was editing. Um, it, it was apparently a bit fast for a few people and they were having problems coming and sort of setting up and, and sort of copying what I was doing. Now, although um, OpenHD have improved their docs a little bit more, it's still like, I, I feel a step-by-step -step on a blog might be quite useful. So I'll have a link here to my blog, hopefully. I haven't written it yet, obviously, because I haven't started. And that may be more than one part because if I, if I follow it again, I'll probably do like a part on setting up the the Pies and the uh, the software config on the iNav stuff and any stuff I'm doing to plug the radio in and stuff like that. So that's the step-by-step -step thing. What I'm going to show you here is, is, is any problems I run into during the setup um, and, and what it looks like. So aside from the screen being very reflective, the other problem we had was I was using a, a program called QOpenHD, which runs on an iPhone or Android. I was running it on my iPhone. And unbeknownst to me, the iPhone just doesn't handle like a, an incomplete frame from OpenHD. So what would look like, well, in the screen, I couldn't see any interference for a lot of the time, and yet the iPhone would just sort of halt. So I had like 10 seconds sometimes of no picture and then like little glitchy bits and then it would carry on. So the iPhone screen for recording doesn't give you a very good impression of, of what I'm actually seeing, mostly because <laughs> I'm seeing a mirror anyway. But So I wanted to come up with a better way of doing it. Um, what I want to do is mirror this. There's two HDMI connectors from a Pi 4. In theory, it should mirror out to another display and if that's the case, I can put a capture card, I can put my goggles on and that solves the problem of the reflective screen and solves the problem of being able to capture better stuff to show you. Fingers crossed I'll be able to do that. After that point, if it all goes well, um, the idea is still to go on this big stupid quad which still runs PWM on the ESCs, that's how bad it is. I still need to get that tested properly on iNav. iNav is in there, it's got a compass. Um, I just haven't tested it out properly to make sure the functions work. 
and we don't want to start putting an open HD system in until we're sure that iNav is, is perfect and it will hold position, it will come back to me if there's a problem. So yeah, let's crack on and start upgrading firmware and see where we go from there. So the firmware was updated on the Rover and the Pi pretty easily. That all went back together quite nicely. Tested on the bench, all good. Check the blog if you want detail. I wanted to move on to trying to get a better picture than this. So what I've got here is my Elgato HD60 S Plus. Uh, normally used in game catch if you look at people on Switch playing anything other than PC games, they're probably using one of these. HDMI goes in, USB-C back to the computer where you can either stream it or record it or whatever. I'm going to plug this in to the HDMI output of this and see what I can get. As you can see here, we seem to get some stuff on the game capture window, but it doesn't seem to mirror what's on the screen there. Now, fair dues that there was an actual bit in the config file to say, uncomment this if you want to mirror it, which I did do, and we got exactly the same result. It didn't actually seem to mirror. And this seems to hold up based on the fact that there's still issues open on GitHub saying, this doesn't work still. So I think in this case, the screen might not be able to be used. So I moved over to version two, which is this. This is a little 3D printed case I got. I downloaded it from Thingiverse. Really works well. Um, lines up very nicely with all the interfaces. There is a space here to put a little fan on. Very important if you're using a Pi 4, it will overheat if you don't have a fan on. And without any DSi connected there, we should get stuff coming out of the HDMI which we can see in the game capture. The idea being that there is a, an out in the game capture. Uh, so you've got your going in, that can be recorded and that can pass through, hopefully, into a pair of goggles. So, yep, yeah, this is looking pretty good. We've got boot messages coming up. We haven't got a camera focusing very well. Yep, yeah, this looks much more like it. This, uh, this window you can just see outside is just your controls for uh, streaming and stuff. And there it goes, there's OpenHD. I haven't got the client open at the moment, so it's not going to show anything, but it does show that we've got a picture there. Good stuff so far. What I did next was find my old Ishin Goggles 2, which I reviewed ages ago, which were kind of, you know, okay, but they were 1080p native resolution and had HDMI in. So I figured what I'd do, I'd connect these up to the HDMI out from here and see what happens. But results weren't good. If I connected both up together, then the PC side would come up and I'd just see not supported in the goggles. So then I changed the config file. There's a specific setting for the goggles too, um, but I still seem to have problems. If I had both plugged in, then I'd have all sorts of weirdness on the computer and not supported. If I just plugged the goggles in on their own though, it was absolutely fine. So clearly I would need another way of recording the screen in order to show you guys what was going on. Okay, so here what I think my setup's gonna be based on the testing. I've got the Raspberry Pi 4 in this little case here. It's connected to the Wi-Fi adapter via USB. The other USB is connected to the radio. Um, this is being powered from this charger, which is being powered by this 4S, and that's putting out five volts. You see it's just drawing one amp at the moment. The HDMI from the Pi is going into these. These are the goggles too. And you can see there we've got um, a, a good display. This is a native 1080p display. This, I think we're gonna have to use an Android tablet for. So I'm gonna try this out with um, some screen recording just to see how this goes basically. And we'll have a quick drive around the garden, which isn't very big, but let's see what happens. So here's some of that test. I won't show much because a, I just did it to make sure it would record okay, and B, at some point I managed to bash the screen with my finger, which put a little window up, which is a bit annoying. But before I went out and then did this for proper, I am still noticing I was getting some interference, even quite close up. So I wanted to run this past the Telegram group about has anybody else tried getting uh, an Elgato capture device working with goggles because I couldn't do it. And I didn't get any particularly useful things from that, but I did send a message to a member of the group called Norbert who has got some fantastic DVR footage from his flights and I want to know how he did it and he said he was using um, USB Ethernet in order to have a tethered connection to his tablet because when you've got that hotspot running you potentially get interference which kind of makes sense and perhaps that's what I'm getting uh, and thanks to him I was able to search through some of the settings for my tablet and I found that in my developer options, I could actually set 
the USB to USB Ethernet, which wasn't an option that ever came up when I plugged anything in. It's kind of hidden behind all the developer stuff there. That meant I could go in and I could turn off the Wi-Fi hotspot. I could plug a USB cable into my tablet and the other end into the Pi. And basically I've got a tethered connection, which means no interference. So I checked it, I got a picture and it's looking good. So let's go out and now test it properly. Hello, here we are for the field test of OpenHD. What we have in this big bundle of wires is this is a Hobbymate charger to supply power. We're supplying this with a 4S LiPo, um, and this is then working as a power supply. Coming out of there, we've got the 5 volt supply to the Pi 4. We've got this 9 volt step up adapter, which goes to this pair of goggles, which is a 1920 by 1080 display. We've got coming out of the Pi the Wi Fi adapter, the radio. Uh, plug it in on USB mode and this one here is USB it was Ethernet over USB connecting down to the tablet which is going to do the ground recording and then we've got the rover ready to rove so that's what we're going to do next Sophie is on camera to make sure that no small child decides it's a magic car and runs away with it she's my enforcer so we're going to get going so what you've got in the main window is the recording from the tablet. We did about 25 minutes of actual recording, so we'll flick bits and pieces to and from some commentary we did at the time and external views and all sorts. So the goggles works much better than trying to look at the display. It's a little bit bouncy and the Pi camera is frankly not very good compared to a regular FPV camera. Uh, we're 30, 40 meters out. Mm. Still got a decent uh, view, see where we're going. We we'll basically want to make sure we can get to the end of the field, uh, the diagonal, come back round without much break up. So I continued down to the end of the field and I'll just speed this bit up because it's a bit dull to watch, but it does show sort of little bits of break up here and there. But we reached the end of the field at about 160 meters. And it was all pretty good up to this point, but it wasn't until I turned and started going sort of more of a right angle to myself, um, and especially back towards myself, where you start to get more breakup. And I'm not sure what this was. I mean, obviously I haven't got the antennas in ideal places, both in terms of um, my view being sort of blocked end to end by me. Um, and it may, maybe it's just a ground effect though, but yeah, it got, quite bad up to a certain point where I had a little bit of hanging uh, and a little bit of sort of general dodginess where it's like oh half the screen is, is pixelated out and that's all looking a bit dodgy but um, as I sort of came back closer it it certainly got better but it was definitely much worse coming back to myself than it was going away from myself uh, there must be something on the model or something that's uh, having a, a bit of a, an issue with that but uh, Sophie came here just to, to make sure I'm okay so she could at least uh, get little spots of footage as me going along. You'll see from the external footage that when you see it driving along it looks to be floating quite nicely but when you're on the camera in something like this it really does bounce around a, a lot more. Uh, another thing I should mention here is about the home arrow which seems to be going slightly crazy and I have to admit having just come back and started doing this editing that that's not something I remember seeing in the goggles. I should explain that QOpenHD gets the data down from OpenHD as you might expect but there are certain things that seem to work differently. For example if you look at the, the little speed dial just above the throttle percentage there you'll see that it's stuck on zero. In my goggles this was working absolutely fine. I'd also thought that the compass wasn't working because it should show a north, south, east, west actually on the little uh, notches that are going past and I can't seem to see them but uh, just occasionally they show up there and then they disappear again. I don't know if it's... I, I can't tell if it's disappearing or they're just disappearing into the sky. It's a, it's a little bit hard to tell. But yeah, the, the home arrow was a little bit weird it's like the the direction there drifts a little bit 
but then it, it, it goes a bit crazy. I did calibrate the compass several times outside and I checked the direction and everything seemed good but clearly um, something seems a little off in it because sometimes the direction is nice and static and it looks good and other times it goes a bit crazy. I do notice just reviewing the footage that it's mostly sort of still when the, the, the rover is still. When we start bouncing about that's when we seem to get more spurious readings. We did try going on the path to see if we can get it a bit smoother but yeah essentially this thing bounces around and this camera seems very susceptible to sort of small shakes so no matter how smooth it seems to be looking from the outside uh, on the inside it's a bit juddery and bouncy but that's just kind of the the basis of the camera and the type of vehicle we're using so there wasn't an awful lot of difference <laughs> between going on the pavement and just hastily veering off and going over the grass it's all pretty bouncy Now I had set iNav up with a return to home switch so I thought I'd check it out even though the compass is acting a bit weirdly and what happens it seems to turn the camera to home and then just start driving off in whatever direction it felt like. Weirdly for all of this the distance to home seems absolutely fine it just seems that the compass direction is a, a little bit screwy for whatever reason. I can look at that and I can certainly look at the RTH function because clearly it's trying to steer with the uh, pan control instead of the yaw control as it as it should do here. The good thing about a car setup is even if you've got really strange controls like I've got one stick just for the camera and the other stick for steering and essentially going forwards is that I can easily put Sophie in the goggles and say try this and it's still way easier than trying to get her to fly a quad. And here's Sophie driving the car, FPV, and I've just challenged her to find the patch of mud to which she said, what patch of mud? Which is fair enough, because if you look in the FPV picture, you can't see anything. So I'm sort of calling out left, right, etc. And she eventually sees it about here and, uh, and manages to hit it, which is all good. Very bouncy, but um, she managed it absolutely fine. So nice and easy to drive, but that's, as I said, the beauty of rovers. That said, she did manage to kind of break it. We've been driving for each other's legs. This is what happened. How do you do that? I just saw a fan. <laughs> I can't turn around anymore. <laughs> the screen's gone black. Oh, um, you've broken it. <laughs> oh no. I guess the impact had basically make something come unplugged and cause the pie to basically uh, freeze up there. We had a, a single image left on the screen there, but we just rebooted it and it was good again. And um, I got my revenge back on Sophie by hitting her leg, which wasn't actually on purpose. They are quite hard to steer when they're big and bouncy, but you know, just power through, power through the leg. It doesn't matter. It'll be fine. Yeah, fun had by all. Well, there you go. That's our video for this time. And if you're thinking, isn't this essentially the same video you made last time? To a certain extent it is, but what I wanted to do um, different to that last video is find the right solution that would work with OpenHD. So the little seven inch screen just wasn't working. The iPhone recording via the hotspot wasn't working. So I felt it was important to go back, find out what worked. And now I've got a situation where I can wear goggles and it's much, much better. Um, I can do a tethered recording to a tablet and that doesn't drop any frames. And that's good. So what you're seeing in that DVR footage was a lot closer to what I'm seeing in the goggles. I actually see something slightly different in the goggles because you, you can actually set each screen up. So I'm seeing like a lat long and I was seeing any dropped frames and stuff. And there's certain things you can't seem to put in QOpen HD, but you get the gist. The actual recording was, was pretty much the same. And from that point of view, I get a much better impression and I hope you get a much better impression about the quality of the image you'll get Although I said I don't really like that Pi camera very much. You notice I have to angle it down and the sky is whiting out. With uh, a, a sort of modern FPV camera with good wide dynamic range, you'd see 
of clouds in the sky and blueness and you'd see in the grass and you know it wouldn't go dark one end and light the other but that's just the Pi camera for now. We still seem to have a, I'm not having much luck with compass problems, still seem to have a bit of a problem on that one. But what I did on this one, which I wouldn't do on a machine that flies, is I never went and just had a regular iNav setup without having OpenHD there, because essentially I didn't need to. I wasn't worried about it flying away or you know not position holding anything, because at the end of the day, we're, we're gonna be within like 150 meters of ourselves. So we'd always be able to go and get it back again. Now I might go back and, and look at the, the INF setup for that because I I'm sure I did the compass calibration right and when I had it here on the desk and I had it plugged into INAV I was pointing it at certain directions, I was looking at the compass on my phone, I was making sure it wasn't moving and that looked fine. So whether that might be an INAV to open HD thing or what, I don't know, but it'd be useful to go back and check. However, what I will be doing is doing a completely normal setup of INAV here first. You see I've got a regular VTX, I've got a regular receiver, and I've got a regular FPV camera. So I will be going out and making sure that is absolutely fine before um, OpenHD goes on that. The reason I'm using such a big stupid quadcopter for this um, is literally just because it's so big it's easy to slot all that extra equipment in. I wouldn't recommend this as the, the sort of quadcopter to use. It's big and the problem is is mostly that that sort of PWM signal which means the the, the refresh rate is going to be really slow but that's okay that does take a lot of tuning to sort out but I'll, that's the idea to do next so I'll be going off I'll be doing the INF stuff and then I'll be installing what was on the rover into that and depending how that goes hopefully fine um, I'll then be looking at the idea of using an HDMI to I think a CSI adapter so what you can do is you can take the HDMI out from certain HD cameras and run it into an adapter and run it into the Pi. The advantage being there is normally these HD cameras are way better than that Pi Zero camera I've got there, which is a bit hokey, quite frankly. Anyway, that will be coming up. In the meantime, the other reason I wanted to do this, of course, is to try and document it. So I've written all this stuff down and I've put it on the blog. I'm still saying I've put it on the blog. I haven't done that yet. I still have to finish it off. But as I mentioned before, uh, I've already had a link to that and there'll be a link down below to where you can check it out. Well, that was fun to experiment with a rover. I wouldn't necessarily think a rover's the ideal situation for uh, OpenHD. It, it seems to me like we're gonna get a much better end-to-end -end picture if we're up in the sky because our line of sight between the two antennas is always going to be good but we'll find out what happens in the meantime i hope this has helped and i'll catch you next one bye for now well you've made it to the end of the video so thanks once again for watching if you like what you saw then please consider subscribing and if you really like what you saw then be sure to check out the link to my blog for a variety of ways in which you can help support this channel